Hi, good evening. My name is Gabriel Gonzalez, and in today's lecture, we're going to discuss don't transfer the home to the kids, Medicaid planning. Some quick disclaimers. I am not a licensed attorney. I am not licensed to practice law. I'm not licensed to give any type of legal advice. This video should not be construed as legal advice in any way, shape, or form. This video is just for education and informational purposes only. If you're looking to seek legal advice in the areas of elder law or estate planning, I strongly suggest that you speak to a licensed elder law estate planning attorney in your area of jurisdiction. So to move forward, my presentation is about don't transfer the home to the kids, Medicaid planning. So at this point, I'm going to go with the assumption that you've seen some of my other videos, especially in the areas of gift taxes, estate taxes, um, and uh, an overview of Medicaid uh, rules in relation to long-term care planning. Uh, but if you haven't, I'm going to try to give, as best I can, a quick overview of Medicaid planning in relation to today's question, or today's uh, presentation for that matter. Okay? So, as you know, Medicaid is a joint federal and state program where the rules for Medicaid start at the federal level and the states have the choice of adopting part of the federal rules or all of the federal rules. So it is true that in many states, the Medicaid rules do vary by state by state, okay? Now, Medicaid um, helps pay for the cost of long-term care, okay? That's one benefit that Medicaid has over Medicare, that Medicaid will help pay for the cost of long-term care, okay? so. What are some of the expenses that can be covered in long-term care? Well, we discussed uh, two instances, okay? The first one is institutionalized care. And community care. So institutionalized care is just a fancy word for a nursing home. Community care is you living in the home and having a nurse aide come over and assist you with your activities of daily living. So in order for Medicaid to help pay for the cost of long-term care, you have to actually meet certain criteria in order to qualify for a need of long-term care. Okay? So... I think I've mentioned in some of my previous videos this term called ADL. ADL stands for activities of daily living. That's getting up in the morning, going to the bathroom, brushing your teeth, taking a shower, eating your breakfast, uh, doing groceries. All of those are the sort of day-to-day -day functions that you need in order that you need to do to live in a productive society. Okay? So those are your activities of daily living. After a nurse case manager has made an assessment to see that you are lacking in your activities of daily living and you do need special services, those special services can vary depending upon whether you need community care versus institutionalized care, okay? And everybody's situation and circumstance is very different, okay? Now, we're going to use our good friend John Doe. John Doe has been very helpful in a lot of other presentations and we're going to use him in today's, uh, in today's presentation in order to best illustrate. I, I like to use examples, all right? I mean, I can sit here and sort of regurgitate rules and regulations, but I like to add color to that by giving example, okay? So we're going to use our friend John Doe here. Well, John Doe is 85 years old, okay? John Doe has problems in doing some of his activities of daily living. John Doe also has Alzheimer's, okay, and dementia. And because of his situation, he needs institutionalized care. We're just giving an example here, okay? So he needs to go into a nursing home, okay? Now, The question is, okay, we, we, we know that John Doe needs services and he needs to go into a nursing home, okay? You know, community care is just not going to work for him. The question is, 
Who's going to pay? Now, in my earlier videos, I gave three examples of, of, of entities of who's going to pay. The first one is yourself, self-pay, self-explanatory. So that's you paying at private pay cost, okay? Very expensive. The other one, the other option to pay is long-term care insurance. And lastly, it's Medicaid. So in our example, John Doe cannot afford self-pay. That's too expensive for him. He doesn't have long-term care coverage. So that's not going to work for him. So his only option is Medicaid. Okay? So John Doe realizes that he needs Medicaid in order to help pay for his nursing home stay. Now, he goes, he applies for Medicaid. One of the criteria for Medicaid is what's called the look back period. From the time that you apply for Medicaid, Medicaid has the right to look back up to 60 months, the prior five years, and identify any non-qualified transfers. What are non-qualified transfers? Church donations, donations to charities, uh, gifts made to family members, um, you know, transfers of assets, okay? They're looking, Medicaid is looking at all the non-qualified transfers you've made as opportunity for Medicaid to not pay. Because Medicaid's argument is, well, if you've transferred these assets, then you could have essentially have taken those assets and used it to pay for Medicaid, okay? So when you run into a situation where you have non-qualified uh, transfers, okay, Medicaid will assess a penalty. And then they call it the Medicaid penalty. Now, the Medicaid penalty is not really a monetary penalty. It's not like a fine or anything like that. The Medicaid penalty is basically a deferment period where the individual that's going into that nursing home has to pay at private pay for a certain period of time before Medicaid kicks in. I'll give you a very common example. John Doe, let's just say as an example, had $100,000 in non-qualified transfers. Now, the divisor is the average cost of a nursing home in your area of jurisdiction. So for argument's sake, let's say that that average cost happens to be $10,000 a month. So what happens then, because John Doe made $100,000 of non-qualified transfers and the average cost of a nursing home is $10,000 a month, John Doe has to pay out of pocket for 10 months before Medicaid kicks in. The big thing that a big misconception that a lot of people have, especially when it relates to institutionalized care, okay, is that if they're going to look, if, if, if Medicaid is going to look at, let's say, John Doe and see how much assets he has, they're going to think that John Doe can sort of liquidate those assets and use that to pay for Medicaid before Medicaid um, kicks in, all right? There's a terminology called spend down. Medicaid is gonna expect John Doe to spend down all of his money that he's worked hard for, 
okay, in order to qualify for Medicaid, okay? So just to keep this example as simple as possible, we're going to assume that John Doe's only asset is his home. And the value of that home is $500,000. John Doe has no non-qualified transfers for the prior five years. The only asset that he has is this home. Okay? So since there's no non-qualified transfers in this example, there's no Medicaid penalty assessment period that needs to be calculated. Now, in New York, you are exempt up to $878,000 for 2019 on the equity value of your home. So if the value of your home is under $878,000, in this case for John Doe, it's $500,000, that house is exempt for uh, Medicaid purposes, okay? So it will not be considered a countable resource. Now, the only little catch to that is that when John Doe enters that nursing home, he has to sort of let either the, let Medicaid know or the nursing home that there is a possibility that he's going to be returning back home. If he's going to stay there for an indefinite period of time, there is a possibility that Medicaid could treat that as a countable asset. But the, the little catch to that is that it's going to be exempt so as long as John Doe expresses an interest that this is this him going into a nursing home is temporary, that he has intention to return back to his home. Okay? So given that example, he's home free. John Doe has intention to return back, but in the meantime, he's going into that nursing home. He's under the $878,000 threshold, so he qualifies for Medicaid. It's not a countable asset, right? The house is not a countable asset. Here's the problem. The house is still in John Doe's name. Since the house is in John Doe's name, Medicaid can put a lien on that home, okay? He's, he's single, he doesn't have a spouse, he doesn't have children under the age of 21 or they're disabled, it's just him himself. He has one adult son, but he lives away from his home, he's like 40 years old, okay? The house is under John Doe's name. Under Medicaid rules, Medicaid can put a lien on that house because the house is still under John Doe's name. So after John passes away, Medicaid can go ahead and exercise on that lien and claim ownership of that asset from the estate, sell that home, and use the proceeds to pay back Medicaid. And I mentioned in some of my previous videos, that is what's called Medicaid estate recovery. Medicaid estate recovery. The origins of this rule dates back to 1993. Federal law known as the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993 was the birth of Medicaid estate recovery. Since 1993, many states have adopted a provision that if the individual dies with assets that, that are assets that are in the individual's name, in the decedent's name, that can be probated, or not necessarily probated, but that the decedent had control over, Medicaid can put a lien on those assets and recover from the decedent's estate to pay back Medicaid for what Medicaid had paid to that decedent while they were alive in that nursing home. So 
John Doe learned about Medicaid estate recovery, okay? And he didn't want to have the house in his name. So right before John Doe went into the nursing home, John Doe decided to transfer his home to his adult son, Christopher Doe. I'm going to draw a little picture of a house. And please don't laugh at my artwork. I'm not an art major. That's a house. John Doe is the father. Transfer the house to the son, Christopher Doe. I'm just going to abbreviate, just call it Chris Doe. And that house was worth $500,000, okay? John Doe thinks that he protected his home. John Doe made a big mistake by doing that, both from a legal standpoint as well as from a tax standpoint. And here's why. By transferring the house from John Doe the father to his son Chris Doe, he in effect for tax purposes had made a gift of $500,000 to Chris Doe. That's a problem for two reasons. Those two reasons are one of them for tax, the tax reason, another one is for a legal reason. For tax, under current tax law, an individual is allowed to gift up to $15,000 per year per donee, okay? John Doe, in effect, gained a gift of $500,000 to his son. So the first $15,000 is automatically excluded for gift tax purposes. But the remaining $485,000, he now has to file a gift tax return and report that $485,000. Now that doesn't mean that he has to pay a gift tax, but every individual that is a U.S. citizen or legal resident, has what's called a lifetime gift estate tax exclusion. As of the taping of this video in 2019, the current gift and estate tax exclusion is $11.4 million per person. This is federal, at the federal level. Now, in effect, John Doe can exclude the first fifteen thousand of that gift, but that remaining four hundred eighty-five thousand dollars, he has to file a gift tax return. And what in effect happens is, instead of paying forty percent on that four hundred eighty-five thousand dollars today, that four hundred eighty-five thousand dollars actually gets applied against his lifetime gift estate tax exclusion. So we take eleven point four million dollars and subtract. $485,000. I actually have my handy calculator here, so we're going to do a little bit of quick calculation here. That leaves John Doe with $1,915,000 left of his exclusion. Now, Keep in mind that the exclusion does increase uh, every year due to inflation, and the exclusion is also affected by what the laws are at that point in time, okay? So if John Doe were to pass away, let's say the very next day that he gave that gift, his exclusion would not be the original $11.4 million. His exclusion will now be $1 million, I'm sorry, $10 million. Uh, Yes, it would be $10,950,000, $915,000, okay, my apologies, 
So again, he starts off with 11.4 million. You subtract the the gift, the taxable gift of $485,000. So he's left with $10,915,000. So if he died, that would be his exclusion. And every time he were to make a taxable gift above the $15,000 limit, that $11.4 million exclusion just gets chipped away, chipped away, chipped away, all the way till it hits zero. Then once it hits zero, anything that he that John Doe passes away with, whether it's a gift or any assets he owns at date of death, it's going to be subject to a 40% estate tax, gift estate tax, okay? So that's issue number one, the tax. The second issue is the legal side. By him transferring the ownership of that home from John Doe, the father, to the son, he made a $500,000 gift. Now, we mentioned that at the time that you file for our Medicaid, Medicaid has a five-year look-back period to see if there's any gifts, transfers of assets that would constitute a gift uh, in order to calculate the Medicaid deferment penalty period, okay? So in this example, John Doe gave away a, a house worth $500,000. The average cost of a nursing home is $10,000 a month in this example. In effect, and I'm just, just to check my math, in effect, by John Doe gifting that home to his son by transferring the title, he now has to wait 50 months. He has to pay out of pocket for 50 months before Medicaid kicks in. A very bad mistake. Now, I'm actually going to take the tax implications and take it a step further. Okay? Now, when you give a gift to someone... There's two components that we have to consider. Fair market value and cost basis. Okay? Now, let's just assume that John Doe bought that house in 1980, and that house was worth $100,000. I should say he paid $100,000. That was his cost basis in 1980, okay? And for argument's sake in this example, let's just assume that the fair market value in the house, of the house today in 2019 is worth $300,000. So the house went up in value. At the time that he gave away the house to his son, but before I even get to that, what's the difference between three hundred thousand and one hundred thousand? There's two hundred thousand dollars of untaxed gain. Okay. Now, when you gift an asset from the donor to the donee, an asset that appreciated in value, what happens in effect is when Chris Doe, the son, okay, the son receives that asset. He receives it at the asset at the fair market value of three hundred thousand. However, the donor's basis is the same for the donee. So I'm using a terminology here. So the donor is the giver. The giver here, the donor is the father. Okay, the son is the donee. He's receiving the asset, okay? So because he's receiving appreciated property as a gift, whatever the donor paid is the donee's cost basis. So in effect, this $200,000 untaxed gain got carried over to the son. So his basis is also $100,000, okay? Now, if the son later on sells that home tomorrow, 
the son is going to have to pay a $200,000 ordinary gain because since the house was held for less than one year, he's going to have to pay $200,000 tax on that, on that gain. Okay? Not a very good situation. Now let's compare that to the alternative. Let's suppose, let's suppose that John Doe left the house in a trust, okay? And that the trust was going to transfer that house to uh, the son upon the father's passing. So what happens for estate tax purposes is, same example, John Doe's basis was $100,000. The house was worth $300,000. So there's $200,000 of untaxed gain. However, at the time of John Doe's passing, the house was still in John Doe's name. What happens? That whole $200,000 untaxed gain went bye-bye. Why? Because under t estate tax rules, upon the passing of an individual, all of the assets get what's called a step-up in basis. So John Doe's cost basis of this home is not the original $100,000. It's the $300,000. Now, what ends up happening in the situation is this, okay? John Doe has to file an estate tax. Well, he doesn't have to. In this situation, he doesn't have to file because the uh, his estate is just the home in this example, and it's under the $11.4 million. So he doesn't really have to file an estate tax return, okay? But if he did, he would have to report the $300,000 as the asset that he owned at date of death. Since it's under the $11.4 million, he's not going to owe any federal estate tax. However, for John, for, for Chris Doe, the son, the cost basis for Chris is not the $100,000 that the father paid for. It's the fair market value at date of death because you get a step up in basis. So Chris is going to inherit the house for $300,000. That 200000 untaxed gain that the father had went bye-bye. So now, Chris's cost basis is the fair market value of date of death. Now, he sells it tomorrow. What do you think his gain is going to be? 300 minus 300 is what? Zero. That's why there's a big difference between a gift and an inheritance, because... In most instances, you're better off receiving an asset as an inheritance than it is a gift because what ends up happening is by you gifting it to someone, you're sort of deferring the, the taxing of that gain at some point. So it's more of a tax deferral. Whereas receiving the asset as an inheritance because of the step-up basis rules, you essentially can wipe out any untaxed gain. That's a pretty neat deal, right? So, in a nutshell, let's kind of go over the question here. Don't transfer the home to the kids, Medicaid planning. So, I kind of already went over both the tax as well as the legal side as to why it's very bad transferring the home from yourself to your kids because there's some negative tax implications in place as well as legal implications, particularly with the look-back periods and whatnot. Um, is there anything else to consider before wrapping up this video? I think we pretty much covered everything, um, at least to sort of drive the point home about don't transfer the home to the kids, Medicaid planning. Hopefully this video has been informational and informative. I do thank you for taking the time to watch my video. Have a good night.